information is moving incredibly fast in this space and you have to constantly update your probabilities and your thesis. Like people are still latching on to a Solana that is three years old or two years old. Like just go and read the Helios blog post on Fire Dancer and then come back to me. Just do that. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Maximalism has never served anyone well, but I'm incredibly excited because it goes back to this idea of coordination. When you have an environment that is lower fees and it's faster, it's better, it's cheaper, then it unlocks non-linear consumer behavior. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Lightspeed. Today, we're joined by Santiago, who's a crypto OG. He's a prolific investor. He's the co-host of Empire and also maybe the biggest fan of Harry Potter that I know. So, Santi, welcome to the show. <laughs> Garrett, it's great to be here. Uh, you know, it was really sad to see you leave Empire because it, you made my life incredibly easy. But it's great to see you now go to squads and everything. So really happy about that. Yeah, well, thank you. For people that don't know, I used to be the producer for Empire. And actually, I did my first two podcasts I've ever hosted with Santi when I filled in for Jason. So if you don't listen to Empire, I'll put a link in the show notes. It's Blockwork's biggest show, but Lightspeed is the fastest growing. So, you know. Not surprised. We've timed it well with Solana kind of getting the narrative over the last six months. And we're going to get in, into your Solana thesis. I want to talk about mm -hmm. your predictions for 2024 and some themes that you've talked about. But before we do, I would love to give people context of your journey in crypto. I think you found Bitcoin in 2012 and then going into Parify and investing full time. So could you maybe just start with your origin story and we'll go from there? Um, yeah, for me, crypto is really interesting. Uh, my background is in game theory. And at the time, it was really Bitcoin. And uh, I was at JP Morgan doing investment banking stumbled on the R Reddit kind of Bitcoin forum. And I thought the, the white paper was a really a, a new chapter in game theory. Send it to all my professors said, hey, this is really interesting from optimizing payoffs. Because when you think about it, like I love talking to people that are very skeptical of crypto. And I do that often these days because it really forces me to deconstruct crypto to very basic primitives of like, why does this matter? Because I think you constantly need to ask that question, not because prices are going up or down, just fundamentally because everyone has a high opportunity cost. And I think it forces you to center, like, what is the North Star? Like, what are we trying to build here? And I think that will touch on a lot of the things we talked about in this pod. And the way I now frame it, um, perhaps I didn't understand it fully back then, but the intuition is coordination is at the bedrock of every system. And when you look at their frictions in all, in all kinds of systems, healthcare, finance, government. And when you can improve coordination, we become better as species. Like humans are phenomenal because we have this brain that allows us to communicate and communication leads to better coordination. But that's, we're, we're not perfect in that continuum. And over time, if you look at major breakthroughs, it is because we've become better at coordinating. The internet allowed us, the printing press allowed us to disseminate information. And I think crypto comes and really helps us fix this coordination problem that the founders of the internet acknowledged that they didn't want to solve. You, you'll hear Mark Andreessen, you'll, call, you'll hear Tim Berners-Lee say, we really punted the notion of moving money in the same way that we move information. And commerce, this idea of transacting value between one another as social species, um, really creates this link and is probably the most important thing to coordinate. Because if you're not transacting value, you're not really coordinating much. People don't care, right? You have to go back to what is the incentive. When there's value, there's a clear incentive and motive to do that. And so crypto is fundamentally explosive, like revolutionary from that standpoint. And I don't care if you believe in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana, whatever. At, at, at the end of the day, it really is. I think everyone can fundamentally agree on that premise, which is if you can improve coordination, then you start unlocking so many different possibilities that weren't. And, and I think that's why crypto is really exciting. Um, so, I'll, so I'll pause there. And so over the years, like this has become like a, the common theme as to why I, I'm fascinated by this space and, and why I think I'm earlier today than what I was in 2012, because you extend this idea of becoming better at coordination to so many different things beyond what was a very narrow use case of Bitcoin and has so far kind of widened out in its aperture. But I think we're fundamentally extremely early still. I'm, I'm curious, you've been through so many different evolutions of crypto and so many ups and downs and cycles. I think you joined Parify, which is one of the first investing funds in the space in 
February 2020. So that was a month mm -hmm. before Black Thursday happened, which was when MakerDAO almost yeah. fell apart and crypto lost a third of its market cap in one single day. So a lot of people didn't see that happen. Can you maybe just describe starting at Parify mm -hmm. and then maybe going through mm -hmm. that experience and how it's shaped you as an investor? Uh, yeah, look, I, I was angel investing um, be between like what happened in 2012 and 2020 was I was working at a venture fund called SageView Capital. What was unique about it is that we were investing in open source software when a lot of traditional investors didn't understand how you would monetize open source software companies. Then Red Hat got acquired by IBM. Then you had a, a, it sort of gave people this idea that open source is incredibly powerful. It's exciting. Um, monetizing it was and still is a challenge in traditional context. Uh, when you think about the the internet, like Tim Berners Lee, the founders of the internet are not like billionaires. They should be, but they're not. Most of the value has accrued to that top layer of applications. And crypto really, my pitch to the fund back then, and I kind of went around Silicon Valley pitching, like I have a memo that I wrote to Sequoia because I wanted to do early stage. And I said, God, you should invest in the projects back then were like, this was StoreJ, like distributed file storage system, I think, and still today was a killer use case. They were investors in Dropbox. And so I was like, guys, you know, this is relevant. Open source attracts like really this chaotic innovation. And, but you know, they, they discounted crypto much, much like people still today. But nonetheless, in that journey, I was angel investing, but I felt really comfortable and I still do um, taking risk with my personal like proprietary capital. And I always felt that that was the nature of the game for me. And joining Parify was really the impetus of a great matchmaking. Uh, you know, Bain introduced us and, and Ben's a great, you know, he has a great similar background to me. And we both agreed that one of the killer use cases of this coordination and, you know, applying crypto was decentralized finance for the single reason that if you talk to anyone in finance, what the major problem is yeah, that has a friction point uh, is this counterparty risk. And when you can build systems that don't require trust or trust minimized and you minimize counterparty risk it is it is a very big unlock and so ben was getting started he had survived this bear market he had just raised parify to like the, the peak of the ico boom and he, he had managed to survive and so i was lucky to join him at a time where we were coming out of the bear and and DeFi summer started our thesis was being very focused on DeFi when other funds were just really generalized and it was, it was, it was chaotic, but it was a very fun <laughs> journey. Uh, I've all since left, but we can talk about like what happened during that moment. <laughs> this is when COVID was going on, the markets absolutely crashed. But then soon after that, you had the run up and that's when all the attention came back. That's actually when I came back into the space. I got involved in 2017, but I think like most people that did, almost everybody left. Maybe <laughs> didn't sell everything, but they kind of left and didn't pay attention anymore. Now it's you who actually stuck around. So. One of the big questions for me is how the hell did you keep your conviction then and now? Because even people in the space today, they're like, oh, am I crazy for being here? Like, is this magic internet money? You've been mm -hmm. here through multiple cycles and you've seen it at the end of the day. It only goes up. When I say that, though, you go through massive volatility. So how do you hold that conviction through all this? Look, it wasn't easy. Uh, after 2018, we went through this phase of raising money for decentralized X and it was decentralized everything from finance to Uber and Airbnb and everything in between. Um, and I made a lot of mistakes during that process. Um, and one of the things that was very helpful for me was going back and, and documenting and diagnosing those mistakes at that point. God, if you were to look at some of my old wallets, I invested in all kinds of stuff. Um, like everything, it's very much a power law distribution in terms of returns. It takes really one or two bets uh, to be right, of course, in, in the right size and, and timing to your point is really instrumental. I say this now and it's common parlance, which is time in the market beats timing the market. I came at it from a venture standpoint. When I invested in Ethereum early on, it was in Bitcoin. It was like this could take 10, 20 years as a venture investor. I think you, you have that level of kind of time horizon and duration. But of course, you say that and then in practice, you get slapped in the face when what you think ha can happen in 10 years happens in three months. You know, Ethereum went from 75 cents to 18 bucks in less than a year. And you're sitting there saying, I am forced to now think more like a hedge fund manager than a venture investor because you have this liquid venture asset class that is in constant price discovery. And that requires, you need to acknowledge that. 
you can't just sit in a vacuum and say, I'm going to be a venture investor and I don't care. I'm not going to touch it. I think certain people have done that. But emotionally, I think it's incredibly hard. And I went through this process of like going through all of my, all, all my mistakes and setting different kind of frameworks, like part venture, part hedge fund by trial and error. And I think that was, had I not done that before joining Parify, I don't think I would have had, I mean, any, any success in doing that. Um, and I, I don't think I would have been comfortable managing other people's money had I not gone through that journey. And so I documented a lot of it. I haven't written in five years, but I have the sub stack where I wanted to not only document it, but also publicly stake it for my personal accountability and also to invite criticism into my process, kind of open sourcing my brain and saying, okay, I want to invite criticism because that's just ultimately what's going to help me find the truth faster. Um, and so I now do it on Twitter, which is, you know, I think short form content is just faster. It's, it's stream of consciousness, whereas writing takes much more time. But yeah, writing was a big component of that. And I know your co-host Mert is a big advocate of that. And I generally think that you write for yourself to document and to do introspection, which investing is more a psychological sport because managing your emotions is the most important thing, uh, I believe. Yeah, you came from traditional finance. I think you worked at JP Morgan. How do you think, being so early too, how were you able to find this, the DeFi protocols and know where to invest and have that conviction at the same time? Whereas the traditional person that comes from, I don't know, JP Morgan uh, may not be able to do that. Is it maybe that you were actually using these protocols? Do you think that was the core insight that you had? That is probably the most important thing. Um, you came from 2017, 2018, where it was all white papers. And then there was this concept of few protocols like MakerDAO had survived. Not only that, but you know, when you think about the mechanism of Maker, seeing that the value of the collateral at the time was only Ethereum, ETH had gone down 85, 90%. But the peg of, of DAI, the stablecoin, which was minted systematically against that collateral, maintained stable. And that was one incredibly useful for people that had a, a Ethereum stake and didn't want to sell, but had to cover some sort of liability or daily expenses. Maker was like very useful for a subset of people, you know, to this like a money market is like this decentralized bank was a fantastic idea. I think it's one of the best uh, ideas out there. And, and so that really, I think, gave me conviction saying, okay, if, if that works, then then it really opens up other possibilities for other protocols like when you think about i think there is a sequence by which you build a decentralized finance system ecosystem and i think it, it starts with something like a money market and a swaps exchange but really a money market this idea to have something more stable and so many different protocols like had that dependency like when you think about auger like a, a prediction market auger didn't work partially because you couldn't settle the bet in a in a stable unit of account like die and when you make a bet on a prediction it it becomes very hard to settle it in something that is very volatile when you think about commerce when you think about payments you need to have what is now a stable coin um, and i think that was instrumental in using that minting and, and going through that process was uh, probably the thing that gave me the most amount of conviction and insight into DeFi being a thing before it was DeFi. One of your favorite questions I saw that you like to ask founders is what surprised you the most throughout your journey? <laughs> what is something just over the last, you know, several years that you've been in crypto that's surprised you or changed your mind the most? Oh, great question. Um, I, I think it goes back to this idea that I think we're earlier now. I don't think you meet anyone that says I, I was very early. I think you always feel that you're late because of by virtue, probably a price becomes the number one proxy or barometer for that estimation, right? It's like, oh, you see the run up of Ethereum from 75 cents to 2,500. You're like, I'm extremely late to this trade. Um, but I, I think now, and it goes back to as, as I continue to see more and more verticals open up the aperture of how we can actually implement this. Um, it's something that has surprised me because it's been 12 plus years and it just is, is a bit grounding to, to keep that perspective because, um, it is very hard 
when you have this noise of a market that is in constant price discovery telling you that things may be far or too early or the tech just suddenly becomes 10, 20, 30% better because the price runs up and that reflexivity is important. But yeah, I think we're, we're very early still. And that has always been kind of a very humbling uh, experience probably is something that has surprised me the most. Yeah. So important for everybody that's new to crypto to hear that. Um, not, you know, not just trying to create false hope, but I think everybody's felt that way at some point that's been in crypto more than a year. You go through that over and over again. And what is it? Let your winners ride because you often see, you know, tokens, ecosystems that go up in value and you're like, oh, I missed that one. I should look for the one that's sub $100 million market cap. And then often what you realize is those that have done so well in the past are often the ones that do well in the future. And I've noticed over those last several years, one thing that you've avoided is maximalism. And I think a big part of that is you always describe that you think in probabilities. And a podcast that I first heard you on was in 2021. And even back then, you were talking about Solana quite a bit. So can you talk about how your thought process and how your investment framework has led you to such conviction on Solana. And just to throw a quote mm -hmm. for people out there, in the beginning of December, uh, Sanzi said, I think there's a 20% chance that Solana flips ETH. And then in their predictions episode, not long after that, you said, I see no reason that the Solana market cap shouldn't match Ethereum's at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, my, my relationship with Solana is, goes way, like at Parify, it was, we did that like deal directly with the foundation. And I was also an investor, early investor in Multicoin. Um, and back then it was, I thought that they would capture alpha that I wouldn't, um, and that kind of forced me to pay attention to it and discover it. Um, I think that the biggest insight is most recent actually, because sometimes you invest in stuff from a structural standpoint as a hedge and you have a lot of exposure to a particular ecosystem. In this case, Ethereum, I was, I've always felt that if you don't have skin in the game, you're not going to pay attention. So you need to have some amount of value, again, value in stake to pay attention. Um, and and it, m the biggest insight most recently happened when I, I, I've said it publicly, I, I went back and I love going back and hearing people and the way that they've expressed themselves over, especially a founder. You, you hear Anatoly constantly say the same, same concept of why he started and, and his vision for Solana. And it really comes back to this idea of putting NASDAQ on the blockchain, like this, this single shared state, like you fix latency in information and that is incredibly useful and valuable. And <clears throat> you'll hear me, if you go back to my podcast over time, talking about Solana, I think Bankless invited me and I was with one of the co-founders of Lido talking about Solana. This is when Lido was also exploring, like Vasily's an investor in Solana, early investor actually. And the common criticism that Solana was facing and still does is the higher hardware requirements. You know, in Ethereum, anyone can run a light client, a node and with a Raspberry Pi, and that's super nice in theory. Uh, in practice, no one really runs a node on their kitchen table um, because again, you kind of delegate, outsource that to a more technical operator like Lido. This aha moment was the focus of the Solana team in, in understanding the type of client that is going to use that blockchain, you overcome the idea that, no, wait a minute, there are plenty of people that are willing to pay for that higher hardware requirements and bandwidth and storage costs. If you think about the three components of costs, because having like solving latency is incredibly valuable. And Merck recently over the weekend was tweeting about the, the scalability trilemma. <laughs> You know this idea of decentralization security and scalability and they're not mutually exclusive per se but you have to make some trade-offs at least initially and i just think solana has got extremely right is the scalability component like you are seeing it in real time you know in, in tandem with hearing anatoly say that understanding okay hardware requirements are not as important like you overcome that friction point and then you pair that with all the activity and usage that you're seeing in jupiter and tensor. And, and, and I think the evolution of the apps in Solana pre and post FTX collapse were like, were meaningfully, meaningfully different. Like, uh, not to like discredit the early apps in, in the early days, but I think now you're seeing beautiful apps that Web2 people, like, if I were to send someone Web2 that is new to crypto, I would, I would send them probably to a Solana app because it's faster, it's better, and it's cheaper. And, it, and, and the user experience is not that dissimilar from a Web2. It, in fact, it might be even better. And that, in my mind, has um, helped me revisit and update a lot of my mental frameworks 
on scale on, on kind of how blockchains like the scalability trilemma and what is the most important thing. Um, and, and so, yeah, it's been, it's been a journey I, and I wanted to make it also very public because I categorically think that there's not a perfect blockchain out there. And again, we're incredibly early, but from a philosophical standpoint, I admire the Solana team and their openness. And you're here and I totally constantly say like, there are so many things that we still haven't figured out. Fee markets are one and fire dancer and getting to that point is another. And I think ultimately that level of open-mindedness from them is what probabilistically will make them become the, the most important blockchain out there. Um, and Ethereum has this problem where you have a more kind of decentralized leadership, right? You know, Vitalik still holds a lot of power in, in his decisions and what he talks about publicly about the vision of where things should go, but it is incredibly hard to coordinate. And, and Bitcoin's also had this problem, right? Um, you know, there's ways to resolve that, like the upgrade for, to prove a stake and, EIP 1559 for Ethereum is probably one of the most impactful things of human coordination ever. You know, it's not a small network and you, you ultimately go through that decision-making process from an upgrade. Like it, it is a, from a coordination standpoint, it might be one of the most impactful things in, in the history of mankind. And people might laugh at that, but I think it's worth like putting into perspective, but it also has a challenge that as you think about Ethereum and the scalability roadmap, like I, I just have more visibility in Solana attracting way more usage. And it is really predicated on seeing the scalability component being really figured out. And if you have a lot of users, it improves the economics for validators and invites more validators, and improves decentralization of validator set. It also increases security because you're now more decentralized. And so ultimately like that flywheel, I see it working and I see it strengthening more and more and more for Solana. Whereas I don't have that level of visibility and conviction and I invite anyone to push back on that and how the current L1, L2 architecture is going to get to the point where Solana today, much less with Fire Dancer gets. And so now I am challenging every single one of my teams that I'm an investor in when they go through this journey of saying, where should we build? I always say, well, what can you get from these other ecosystems that you cannot get with Solana today and Solana with Fire Dancer? And to this day, I have not heard a very compelling answer as to why you'd go somewhere else other than there are a lot of liquidity and users on Ethereum. But ultimately, I think that that is not a very compelling or convincing answer because we're all, you can't make this decision as a builder of where to deploy on the current state of users, which is like micro beta testers. I think you have mm -hmm. to have a reasonable conviction around, yeah, we're going to onboard billions of people. And when you think about where the capital and the user is going to flow, that's the bet that I'm, I'm sort of like trying to predict that. Yeah. I hope developers are listening to this. We talk about a lot on this podcast, how in Solana, you're seeing some sorts of vertical integration and that could be Jupiter where they have the aggregator, but they also now have perpetuals and they're expanding into the launch pad. Then you have Jito, which is kind of like a flash pots and also a Lido combined. And I think part of that, and you haven't really seen that in Ethereum, even though they are trying to vertically integrate things like Aave. Um, but I think a hard part would be if you do want to expand one, do you know if the chain can support it just from fees and composability, but two, like, where do you want to build? Are you going to build on optimism or Arbitrum? Like which L2 are you waiting? on to mature and where you're going to release that next product that you want to be composable and i think that's probably held things back a little bit and another narrative that i'm seeing that's kind of nebulous santi and i'm, I'm just curious how you've thought about this because i think it's popped up before is this idea of scarcity versus abundance and by scarcity i mean like bitcoin was the 21 million and there's a real reason for that hmm. ethereum kind of has uh scarce block space um but then you see things like solana that are a bit more about abundance and you can see that with the fee model as well which brings in a lot of questions about accrual and value and then we have things like celestio which is catching a big bid and i think one of their taglines now is like i don't know but it's like abundance for all or something it's like really leaning to this idea that crypto doesn't have to be only about scarcity but i think that's hard for some people to grasp because when crypto first became a thing through bitcoin <laughs> everything was about scarcity everything was about limited supply so i'm just curious how your frameworks evolved on that I, I think you're spot on. Look, um, the the thing about Bitcoin centric mindset is that scarcity drives value, whereas I think you should invert and you should think value drives like like you not invert, but just more so say utility drives value. And certainly in that exchange, the, the idea of having talk about it like another big primitive of, of crypto unlock is this idea that you have 
digital property that is provably scarce or provably the like you can trace the origins of it like provenance and so that's hugely valuable like go read hernando de soto and property rights and how that was instrumental for economic development now extend that to a digital context where most of our lives and exchanges are happening in the, in the digital world and finally for the first time ever you can have this digital property that is recorded in a time and space that is that is not contested that is that gives you guarantees that transcend a sovereign to say i uploaded this picture or this piece of content at this particular moment in time and this is the first time that it was seen in existence and you can prove to that that is incredibly valuable for our, anyone artists talk to a notary talk to a lawyer like when i say that this is one of my entry points into a very critical brain of, of crypto i i tell them this digital property concept and they start to get it if you're a lawyer if you're a noter if you're an artist like it becomes incredibly useful to like easy to see um and bitcoin like sure it's you know i, I i'm skeptical of this idea of digital gold because gold took centuries to ossify as like a social construct that has value but it's a terrible semiconductor i don't know if you've seen what a billion dollars of gold stored looks like in a vault but it's not easy to move or secure and has all these costs attached to to them so i kind of sympathize with like like that can serve a, a niche use case but now you have stable coins so like you don't necessarily need to use bitcoin as a medium to like for capital flight so if you think about like the size of a table or your room like gold is eight, you know nine trillion um and how much do you think that the value of the internet is like certainly bigger than that speck of dust in your room that is eight trillion it, it's way larger than that as we think about it today of course now that you think about well what other use cases are possible because of this digital property concept like it's almost like going back to 2002 and saying you had the internet people were skeptical of in 2002 not long ago people were very skeptical of the internet because you had just had the dot-com crash and then the smartphone came around i don't think very people envision how impactful the smartphone would be and all the different applications that have now sprung up and are incredibly valuable and almost to the point of like essential components of our lives uh, and i think crypto is in that state today where the far more interesting point is this abundance of digital property and explosion of creativity and exchange and better coordination that um you know is if you think about a game like you know good luck trying to bootstrap and scale a game with only 10 a collection of 10,000 pfps like it should be it should be very abundant it should invite people to come in and exchange so i think that's uh the more important and vastly larger market that i think crypto will 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 cover uh like there's still a time and a place for digital scarcity but abundance is something that technology is always like the, the real unlocks in technology have been because it created way more abundance. hundred percent agree. That's something you see like with Figma, for example, that it made like everybody that was a company, a designer, essentially it almost introduced abundance of design. And then also this is a little tangential, but I was reading this morning on the vision pro that's coming out and just like, what are mm -hmm. going to be the use cases? And, you know, they think it's going to be a small set of buyers at first. And a lot of that's just how much they can manufacture. Mm -hmm. But I watched the, the highlight video of the court side, camera that's set up specifically for the vision pro it is absolutely insane and, and like my point of all this too is just as you move more digitally online all of these things just become more valuable and useful in themselves but if there's not a place where you as an average consumer can interact with it then it doesn't matter and i think for crypto to actually get widespread adoption you have to have these things that are like entertaining things based around community and also things that are like low fees and cheap to interact with and you've talked mm -hmm. about jupiter jupiter is all time it's maybe my favorite crypto app i've ever actually yeah. gotten involved jupiter with. and tensor for sure um, Huge fans. Yeah, now today Disney announced this like walkable rug that you can move around and stay static. Like, then you start seeing like the challenges of like interacting in a virtual world. Uh, I mean, to, I think we should consider ourselves incredibly lucky. I certainly consider myself incredibly lucky to have discovered crypto at an early point in my career when I was able to take uh, like way more risk because I didn't have any obligations. I was lucky to have graduated early, had a scholarship from JP Morgan, didn't have debt. I was paid reasonably well as an investment banker, and that allowed me to invest a decent amount of money into the space. But 
stripping away all of that, I think I consider myself incredibly lucky. I've discovered this space that has continued to attract the smartest people that I've met, but also to find like a, what I think is a calling that you can, you talk about your journey in crypto. So you first came into Blockworks, you were a producer, you're putting incredibly show notes for Empire. Then you very quickly within a year, launch your own podcast that has far surpassed Empire in success. <laughs> Right. I don't know about that, but it's done. Yeah, no, it's well, done pretty well. But, you know, the, the, the yeah, Twitter polls don't well. lie. <laughs> and and now you're going to one of the top protocols in Solana and you're going to run BD for that. Now, that journey is not linear. And it when you think about the probability of you doing that in a traditional context in Web2 or traditional in the real, like in the non-crypto world, real world. <laughs> yeah, no chance. it would have been very hard. And I've always been frustrated with that. And I think ultimately... Crypto is what it is because of that. I think you ultimately related to what it means at the individual level. And open source systems are incredibly powerful because you discover information. Information service surfaces is faster than in non-open source systems and closed systems. And that empowers people in, in a very meaningful way because the people that are surfacing that information that are more competent and knowledgeable, you don't need a college degree to be discovered in crypto. If you're smart, if you're putting out good ideas, you can contribute. Not only that, contributors can accrue a lot of value when you think about that stack. That, that is why you need a token to capture that value and that contribution. And I think that's the most important thing that matches with so many other trends that are happening in this post-industrial revolution world. Like we are shifting away and for a while now from this nine to five static, industrial revolution concept of organizational, like of how we coordinate and, and create value and how we think about like measuring output to, you know, COVID comes along and it says, no, you can actually work from home and still be productive. And, you know, the, the office becomes less and less important. Um, and crypto, I think is, fits into so many different things that are happening. And so I consider myself incredibly lucky to have been born at a time where the pace of technological innovation was just going absolutely parabolic and crypto comes at a time that allows us to really like take that to the next level. And then you have AI and other components. Um, and I think the more and more I think about it is crypto fits into that. Um, and is the linchpin to really unlock so much more value and possibilities. And there are generations I think that go by that don't have this, this moment. So I, I for me, it's like, when you think about what keeps me in the game, I love this game because like, I don't think there's been a period in, hu in human history where we're seeing this amount of innovation. And not only that, but we finally, I think, have solved the key issue of open source development, which is how do you monetize? How do you, how do you fix the continuity issue? And it unlocks so many different possibilities of people being able to contribute to these systems without necessarily having to go through the common the common system that is that is very hard to access like no one not everyone can afford a four-year education that doesn't necessarily mean they're not smart and now they can circumvent that um and go directly into you know these systems that will reward them if they are contributing value and the nice thing about this open system it's also highly capitalistic so value gets there's a price that gets tagged to that, whether you believe in it or not. And the price discovery component of all that is, is something that, you know, something else, but at least you have something to latch onto. Ethereum as a piece of technology has created probably the most amount of millionaires across the, a, a wider set of people than any other piece of technology in, in that. Yeah. And so that's incredible. Yeah. I think a lot of people get turned away from crypto just because they think it's all speculation. Uh, they see some of the the degens, including ourselves, um, and and you know Twitter can be a harsh place if you're new to crypto and you try to get involved. Sometimes, but there are some great things there, and I, I like how you said, you know, I love this, I love the space, and I, I saw you tweet once, like. Uh, if you don't love this game, you don't have to play this game. But I think part of it is just embracing it. There's no reason to to hate on the speculation. Obviously, when people are bad actors, you want to call them out and so forth. But just like enjoy it, play the game. You want to find something that really drives you with passion and also that's like intellectually interesting. And mm -hmm. that's what brought me to crypto. And like, 
you talked about accessibility. Santi, I've listened to you for a long time. One, I never thought I'd talk to you. And then, you know, I got to produce your show and I got to meet you. And now I'm actually getting to host you on a podcast. Like this is all within, say, a two year span. And, and anybody can do that. And you can DM people on Twitter and they will respond to you at least half, half the time. And that, that doesn't happen anywhere else. Yeah. There's, I think, uh, going back to what I said at the very beginning, speculation is a component that is a kind of a prerequisite. You see it in any technological revolution. Point me to any movement throughout the history of mankind that hasn't had speculation as a fire that keeps people motivated. There's none. Because ultimately, if you don't transact value and people don't think there's value, then they go elsewhere. It's as simple as that. There's a difference between speculating and gambling. I think there's nothing wrong with speculation. Everyone speculates about everything all the time. You have to when you make decisions, when you try to, you ultimately try to predict the present, but also the future and how you allocate your resources. That's speculating. Gambling is doing things that, that uh, probably can jeopardize your ability to play the game. But there's nothing wrong with speculation. But somehow crypto has gone through this phase time and time again, where we shy away from saying that there is speculation. And a lot of that, I think, comes from we have had it pretty hard. Uh, it's been very hostile for someone that is in crypto. And I think anyone can relate to that. You constantly get questioned. And you go from being the most popular person at a party when crypto is booming to the least popular um, at family reunions when crypto takes a hit. And it questions your identity questions why you do stuff, it's never easy, you know, it can be uncomfortable because somehow you become the linchpin of, of the person in crypto and that relates you to FTX and Terra. So yeah, it's hard, but ultimately I think, you know, um, you just have to deal with that. <laughs> I remember actually the last podcast I was on with you, we were, we were talking about something kind of similar and I had like a date a few days before that. And you get into the question, like, what do you do for a living? And it's like, oh, I work in finance. Like, oh, what do you do? Oh, it's media and startups. And then they ask more questions. You're like crypto. Like, oh, okay. We'll see how the rest of this day goes. Quick break to tell you about an upcoming event. I promise you don't want to miss. It's Blockworks' biggest and best institutional conference called DAS London. It's a two-day event happening in London this March. We're going to have over 700 institutions, 130 speakers, and a couple thousand of us all under one roof. Crypto is in a position for the first time to actually onboard these institutions and they're showing up. We have companies from BlackRock to Visa launching real products in the space. We have the real world asset narrative taking off. We have things like payments that have been exponentially growing. And then we have things like DeepEnd happening in the Solana ecosystem. There's a ton of capital right now in this institutional space. It's going to be coming on chain. It's going to completely change the industry. Whether you are an institution or you're a retail user or you just want to learn more about what's going on in the space, this conference is for you. You're going to be able to meet some of the best and smartest people in the space. The speaker lineup is absolutely incredible and you'll get to hang out with me. But the best part is you actually get 10% off your ticket if you use Lightspeed 10 when checking out. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, I recommend buying this today because one, you'll forget about it. Two, these ticket prices go up every single month. So anyways, I hope to see you there. Now, let's get back to the show. But Santi, I want to start to talk about some of the predictions that you had for 2024 and just some themes you're looking at, kind of like the next stage for crypto. And I think just because we were talking about Solana before this, maybe the first place to start is I heard you say that you think there might be up to, I think, 10 unicorns that appear in the Solana ecosystem and DeFi and DPIN. And you can talk about that, but I also want you to compare that to you were very early in Ethereum DeFi. You were close with Aave and Stani and Hayden and Uniswap. Um, I don't think you're as bullish about the DeFi projects that are happening there. Can you maybe describe the difference in those two ecosystems and why you think that? It's all on a relative basis. Look, at, I think um, DeFi has been long forgotten, you know, since I left Parify, the, you know, DeFi kind of has been at the backseat. I think it will have its moment and it will shine. Maybe not, certainly not in the same way that it did in DeFi summer, but it will power a lot of the different applications. Um, so it's my interest in DeFi and Solana is this idea that I'm seeing way more activity because you know when, when you have fees that are negligible, uh, people might say, "Well, how is that any different from Binance Smart Chain or something?" And, and it's a good, it's a good point. You know, when Binance Smart Chain at one point eclipsed, like had more transactions and users bridge over. Than Uniswap, and then the activity has subsided because it's very much a centralized chain. Uh, 
I think what people get wrong about revisiting their thesis about Solana because it has its you know moments where the chain is halted and you know people think it's a VC coin and whatever and, and that ultimately is the opportunity for people that can can actually do the real work and understand the you know whether you believe the Nakamoto coefficient is like the best proxy for decentralization or, or you know clients, but information is moving incredibly fast in this space and you have to con- constantly update your probabilities and your thesis. Like people are still latching on to a Solana that is three years old or two years old, like just go and read the Helios blog post on Fire Dancer and then come back to me. Just do that. Like, why wouldn't you do that? Right. Maximalism has never served anyone well, but I'm incredibly excited because, you know, again, it goes back to this idea of coordination. When you have an environment that is lower fees and it's faster, it's better, it's cheaper then it unlocks nonlinear consumer behavior. Like people now like extend that to Uber, Airbnb, like. And so you're seeing that in real time. And to me, that's incredibly exciting because candidly, the structure of paying 19 bucks or seven bucks or a thousand bucks of fees on Ethereum L1, at least, is, is not very um, like economically feasible. There, there is still the, the type of user that is going to value that. And of course, then you can extend that to an L2. But you know, I, I remember a, a moment where I talked to the Drip founder um, and he said, look, even if I were to do drip in an L2, it, w- it still would not be economically viable f- for us to do these kind of mass batch like mintings of NFTs. It would still be as, mo- as small on a relative basis as fees are in an L2, Solana still is much cheaper. And so, yeah, that that for me was also a big part of my journey of, of then saying what is now that it's dubbed like only possible in, in Solana. That doesn't mean that L2s and Ethereum are not going to have their moment or will be irrelevant. I mean, I'll, I'll ask you the question. Like, do you think people care about decentralization? Do they philosophically understand or care about security? It's really ultimately boils down to, um, and I hate to say it, but I think it's just more of a practical, not theoretical standpoint, which is people will go where they can do things in a, it, it, that increases their output and utility the most. Security is one of those things that you appreciate if things go badly, uh, but that doesn't mean Solana is not secure. And this is where most people that have been around for a while kind of don't believe that because they haven't done the work. They haven't, and so I, I, that's something that you constantly need to question yourself. Like, is Solana meaningfully less secure than Ethereum? What is your security threshold? What is the decentralization threshold? I think these are fundamental questions that we need to like, that are very theoretical. Mm-hmm. But I think practically speaking, uh, again, I, I go back to one of my biggest shifts over the years is that um, more like scalability and Im- improve the economics of a blockchain. And if you and, and that ultimately is a driving force to improve all the other two components of this trilemma. Yeah, let me double down on that, because actually in the interview you did in 2021, you were talking about the same thing and that it's kind of taboo to ask, like, do people actually care about decentralization? And your point was like, in general, you're like, I don't know. But in general, the average consumer, probably not. But you did say that some of these, I think you call them aggregators, but somebody like Visa would. Mm -hmm. So if you're Visa on Ethereum or Visa on Solana, Solana has about 2000 validators today. And that is comparison to Jay Jog, which I talked about last week. He he's under the impression that maybe you only need 36 geographically diversified validators to actually have the set that you need to say that this is decentralized enough. Do you think this concept that Visa would choose to build on something like Ethereum or Solana still stands because it is something that is more decentralized or do you think they just go and build an app chain? Because that's the other world I see where they're like, ah, we don't need any of this. We'll just do our own thing. It's a, it's a fantastic question. Look, I think technology is always a centralizing force. It has been. And the only thing that might help us decentralize or pull it away from that natural tendency to centralize is crypto. For the simple reason that you can improve the incentive mechanism and you can improve the coordination. But if you don't do that, we're not going to we're not going to overcome that. AI to even the nth degree will be even more centralized. And, and so this is where I think a lot of people fall short in their thinking of like, how do we actually can insert ourselves and overcome that tendency to centralize? And it really boils down to better incentives and, and better coordination. Because if you can create more value, if you can deliver a better experience for the consumer, whether it's the aggregator through incentives, but the aggregator cares about the end user. And so how are you going to be Robinhood or Visa and tell your users, oh guys, sorry, your wire fee is 25, 
we're not really like improving it. We're, that's going to be a bit more expensive and, and it's going to be unpredictable because there might be sp- spikes in the fees. So, you know, you're going to have to bear with us. No, if there, it's just not, it's not realistic to think that way. But I do think that you can see a world where they start using Solana. Like take Uber as the example. Uber was just a killer technology that overcame regulatory pressures, union pressures, habitual pressures of people just naturally thinking of a taxi and they're yellow and they're easy to identify to something that just was incredible because it latched onto a piece of technology like the smartphone that at the fingertip you could hail a cab at any moment in time and it was clear it's transparent it's faster it's better it's cheaper by order of magnitude that's what that's the bar for crypto and if we don't get there we will not overcome the tendency to centralize and none of this will matter at all we're going to be a niche like techno utopian piece of technology like bitcoin was in the day but i'm not here because of that vision alone i think fundamentally we can do that but in order to get there the bar is high it's very high and we're not there yet but i think we have early indications that we can fundamentally have through better coordination increase a ton of value and unlock new possibilities that just weren't possible before and i think solana is by far the the place where I see that that path, like clearly, I don't see it anywhere else. Maybe next gen L1, you know, maybe it's Aptos, maybe it's Sui, maybe these designs, you know, the problem with going first in crypto, and I sympathize with Ethereum is that you didn't have, you know, in many ways, like these other protocols like Solana and others are standing on the shoulder of giants. Like, you know, you're always borrowing stuff in an open source context. And so, you know, but, um, uh, yeah, like uh, an aggregator will care about security for sure. We don't have a secure environment. But again, the question to you, you just pose is, what is that? And I think it's a minimum viable threshold of security that Solana already has. Mm-hmm. I agree completely. Okay, that was very well said. I have like four statements of yours that I think are a little bit unorthodox <laughs> in predictions. Okay. So let's uh, let's four? see if we can run. <laughs> you have a lot more, but I picked out four. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see if we can run through those in the next 10 minutes. So maybe we'll spend mm-hmm. just you know a minute or two on each topic. So one yes. that I have, um, so gaming was really hot. People are like, gaming's going to be uh, the Trojan horse that brings people into crypto. We haven't really seen that play out. But one of your predictions is that in 2024, we're going to see three viral games that hit. So why do you think the timing's now? Oh, just because I've seen it from my vantage point, I've invested in 10 plus game studios. They're building. It takes t- time to build games. There's different categories, fast, casual to like, like fully form, like AAA games. Um, but it will happen. I, I, I've just seen it. Like I'm seeing it in, in real time. It will happen. It's not going to be your play to earn. It's like, that was not a game. That was DeFi with a veneer of, of gaming attached to it. But so was farming. So the <laughs> yam farming was pretty more fun than Axie, probably. No, not to take a stab directly at Axie. Okay. So this next one, me and Mert shit on Blast all the time, which is an L2 <laughs> roll up on Ethereum that you could deposit ETH, but you couldn't take it out. Um, you've actually tweeted a few times about Blast and you'd say, believe it or not, there's actually a lot of developer interest in Blast. What's going on there? And yeah, how do you think about it? Mm-hmm. Turns out when you have over a billion dollars of liquidity locked in there, it attracts a lot of developers that want to tap into that. It's the same reason why people continue to be interested in Ethereum is because the users in large part are there and there's a lot of liquidity. Um, look, I don't, I've never faded a founder that has built great products. And you can criticize the mechanism by which they launched, the way that they framed the risk-free component of that. Like it wasn't perfect by any stretch and it should have just... Nothing is risk-free in crypto. So that word should never be used in any context ever. Um, nothing is risk-free ever in the world, period. Uh, anyways, if you put aside the launch, you know, Pac-Man and the team have built, uh, you know, the, the builders are a blur. And I'd be hard pressed to find someone that says that's not a good product. I always invest in teams that can build great products. And I had the benefit of being an early investor in Blur. And I think the same is going to happen with, uh, with Blast. Look, at the end of the day, the, the more important question that you should always ask, what is the integrity of the team? What is the rug risk? Because, of course, it's a multi-sig. Um, look, you know, I'm not here to tell you that there's no risk. Of course, there's a ton of risk. Um, you know, when contracts are upgradable, you should always be hypersensitive to that. But 
um, yeah, I think there's a lot of developer interest. It's still early, but um, I'll be a judge there and, you know, we'll see. I like it. Okay, so you're a big fan of Solana's global state, but I know you've also gotten some interest in the Cosmos ecosystem. Has that been yeah. something that's just of late? Is there something that has driven that? Or have you always thought Cosmos is going to be this ecosystem that would take off? I had the benefit of being in Palo Alto. So Berkeley was around the Bay and a lot of the Cosmos team came from Berkeley and the People's Republic of Berkeley. And I, I have discovered IBC when I first heard about it was like early, I think it was 2018 or so. It was like in development. And I just felt that it was going to be a multi-chain world as much as I believe Solana is, is sort of far and ahead, but I do still think that there's a place for, um, a place for other chains, application specific chains for the reason, you know, there's just a benefit, like look at the YDX, right? And so when you can have more degrees of freedom and autonomy over these parameters of fee setting and not competing in like this global state and competing for having space in a block. And now we have paralyzed fee markets and whatnot not fully in production, but you know, the idea is really interesting. Nonetheless, I still think it's a multi-chain world. And I think IBC is fundamentally really interesting piece of technology to connect, connect these chains without compromising security. Um, problem is IBC was constantly delayed, but now it's closer and closer. I think there are very interesting developments, IBC being one, the other one is shared security. Like people should go look at and research mesh cosmos this idea of like the problem with app chains was if you're not dydx and you're fully kind of form project the way you bootstrap security is that 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 initial kind of cold start problem becomes very expensive so people need to have these incredibly high inflation curves and staking rewards to attract validators to to go on the chain and so uh, because that's important for security now with mesh and with like ethos is doing, which is, it's taking now, finally, you're going to be able to use restate ETH to bootstrap the security of the chain. So anyways, I think now it's an interesting time for Cosmos. I keep, we keep seeing that every cycle. It's like, oh, Cosmos has probably yeah. really interesting <laughs> tech, probably one of the best techs out mm -hmm. there, but it doesn't shine because it doesn't have a good marketing team. But in short, um, I think it is important to pay attention. IBC has a connectivity tissue across chains, not only within the Cosmos ecosystem, but beyond as a better version of a bridge. And second, this idea of restate and using Ethereum security for app chains is something that is a pretty big unlock. So I'm paying attention for those two reasons. Mm. So Tim, here's how you think about it, but also how teams are pitching you when they're building a, a product in crypto. <laughs> I don't know if this is framing how everyone thinks about it, but you have like protocols and businesses and protocols to me would be, say like Celestia, a protocol could be they're a DA layer. A business would be, okay, we're a DA layer, but then we're planning to expand to these three other products, which might be a wallet, kind of like Uniswap wallet. Or it might be like, okay, we're a DA layer, but we're going to launch a DEX on top of this. And it's kind of this like wedge mentality that a lot of startups have, and then you expand. It's like land and expand. When you think of crypto protocols, do you think of about them in that way that you're like, okay, they're going to find a niche market today and build out from there? Or do you still see it as this money Lego, every protocol or app just does one thing? Yeah, I guess the question is, what is the difference between a protocol and a company? Um, I don't know. I think the lines are very blurred. I, I, yeah. I, I'm, I just think uh, you, it's either like B2B or B2C. I think a protocol is more B2B, uh, like Ethereum. Versus, but, mm -hmm. And the most important thing is to invite, um, you know, be reasonably secure, like be very secure and give uh, confidence for builders to build on top. Like, I guess the analogy would be, and I, I understand analogies are imperfect, but like Salesforce started as a company and then became like an ecosystem because, you know, it had this store and it would invite people to build on top and products that would complement the core feature. Um, I think every, every protocol is a company in some capacity, the, the user might be different ultimately, but I think of them and maybe this is my lizard brain. I think all, everything is a company and you ultimately whether you understand your customer or not is something that I just focus on. Um, I think Solana understands their customer exceptionally well. I think other uh, certain protocols don't understand that or don't want to believe that they're a company, but at the end of the day, you're always a company. I think you always need to think about product market fit and who's going to use your protocol. That to me is no different than a company, right? hundred percent. Okay. Two things to close out. 
one, I want to talk about what's, I, I was going to say what's next, but like, I don't know why everyone thinks there has to be a next, you know, there always has to be the next thing. Um, I, I, I believe you're investing full time. I know you looked into launching a bank and you've hinted at that you might be interested in doing an incubator. So um, yeah, how do how you think about those things these days? Uh, yeah, I constantly think about where it could be most useful to the space because I'm not technical. Um, I certainly invest and it's really nice to, it's like a frustrated dream. I empower, you know, people with capital to go and build. Um, the bank idea was quite interesting. It was at the time where you probably thought it was the craziest idea because you had all, you know, Silvergate was down, the Send network was shut down, FTX collapsed. And so I think the, I guess the appetite to fund a crypto, um, bank was zero, but I had the benefit of just funding it myself. Um, and I, I came out of that process, not convinced that banking is that big of an issue. I just think that. Uh, it might be just that that certain type of customers may not want to furnish all the information to be onboarded into a bank, but I've never had issues with banks. Uh, again, blockchains are perfectly transparent piece of, uh, where you can do all the analysis to trace and track provenance of funds. You can, you'll find a bank out there that will bank you if you can furnish all the information and they'll be using chain analysis on the back end to, you know, do that. But I think certain people may not want to do that and are sensitive to that. My conclusion is I'm still not going to be able to bank those people if I start a bank. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, yeah. And the level of effort was, is pretty high. And so I shelved that project, but I spent a good amount of six, to nine months, like doing talking to users, regulators, different jurisdictions. Yeah. Do you think that's what Coinbase becomes in many ways? Like yeah, how, yeah. how do you think about Coinbase? Coinbase is going to be one of the largest financial institutions in the world over the next 10 years. There's really no reason why they can't extend their offering that you're seeing it on real time. Um, yeah, I, I, I think Coinbase looks very, Coinbase is not just an exchange. It will be a fully fledged financial institution, uh, particularly one that services younger generation, more technically like just in digitally native uh, users. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, stable coins are a fantastic product and you know, obviously they have USDC um, and yeah, I, I think Coinbase is going to be doing way more things than what you're currently able to do on the app today. I agree with you. It's it's kind of like in Solana in some ways that a lot of people weren't uh, very bullish on Solana. It was like the VC coin and then the FTX implosion happened. I think that actually made the community stronger and people started looking at the tech more instead of it just like the price. And the same thing kind of happened with Coinbase where they grew so quickly. They obviously did well, but I think they probably just hired a lot of people that weren't in crypto at all because you saw them launch some products, say some things through their communications and marketing. And it looked like they were almost falling apart and losing market share. And then over this last like six, eight months, they've just been absolutely killing it. They seem pretty crypto native. I, I mean, I can't imagine a better company to represent the space that is more on the centralized side. The work that they've done on the policy and regulation side um, and like offering, I mean, it's synonymous with crypto and they've, they've never been hacked, knock on wood, but you know, they've had a credibly secure setup and they're just the onboard, primary onboarding mechanism, but also the willingness to reinvent themselves and cannibalize certain business lines. Like they're now launching base. Talk about like creating a, a, a easy journey into millions and millions of users, that all their user base, right? 100 million users. Some of them will, they're going to enter Web3, like start using on-chain applications. Well, probabilistically, it's going to happen through Coinbase. So I think they play a, they Coinbase, I respect them because the leadership, I think, has probably felt that they have not gotten enough credibility or, or validation from the crypto community and certainly not from the non-crypto community. So... They've had to probably it's been quite lonely journey for them. Now it's great that they're finally getting some well-deserved credit. I mean, Coinbase developers have contributed a ton to open source. They've done a fair amount of contributions in certain pretty big updates like proof of stake and like the beacon chain, the AP 1559, like they're like, you know, pretty impactful to contributing to some of these standards in crypto. Definitely. And a lot of talent has come out of Coinbase and actually started to develop protocols in like wider crypto and decentralized crypto. Yeah. Like even Mert came out of Coinbase Mert, no as less, well. Yeah. yeah. And like Coinbase credentials, I think it's going to be really cool. If you're a Coinbase user, you're within the app itself, but then they have the self-custody wallet, then they have the Web3 wallet, and maybe they'll have like a safe sandbox that you can play in, which are like these apps that are preloaded, which are on base. But then you can oh, yeah. take your Coinbase credentials and go to like outside of base and you can go to Solana or these different ecosystems. I think that's going to be the ultimate onboarding. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Okay, so I'm going to make you talk about yourself before we close off here. Um, I knew you ran marathons, but I didn't know you were an absolute monster um, at marathons. <laughs> I, yeah, you are. I think you ran three. Did you run three last year? And you're doing two to three this three year? Three last year, and I'm doing Tokyo, Berlin, and New York. Three three last year, three this year. I'm doing finishing the six majors, Tokyo, Boston, and then always New York. I don't know what your time is. I'll let you say it, but I do just know it's inhuman. I, I did my first marathon this year. And after hearing your time, I was like, holy shit, Santi is not just a podcaster and investor. He's an absolute madman. I think running has been great for me. I'm curious what it's done for you. Uh, I'm not like, I, I don't run all the time, but I do think it's been big for mm -hmm. me. So I'm curious, like, what has it done for you? And then also, um, I don't know, like, is there anything you learned from it that, that you could either mm -hmm. apply just to the rest of your life or investing? Running is liberating. You can do it anytime, anywhere. I've never regretted going for a run, whether it's one mile or, you know, 26 miles. It, it, the clarity that I get, it just permeates into other facets of my life. And I'm the type of person that I, I need to exercise to have clarity. Uh, and so I, I love running. I love cycling too. I've, and so talk about the two most insightful learnings that I've done is, I think it relates a lot to investing. This idea of you have to run slow to go fast. It's counterintuitive. When I trained for so many years, I would, this notion of, I need to, every training, I need to push harder and harder and push the limit. Um, and I first learned from the different techniques of the zone two type of training, the Soviets, the, the, the Russians really used it for wrestling, which was they would never go hundred percent in their trainings ever, maybe once or twice before, like, but ever relative to the Americans, they would go all out as like a. The problem was when you go all out constantly in training, the risk of being injured goes up meaningfully. But what happens is you will eventually get injured. So instead of training like the Russians would, you know, 360 days of the year or 300 days of the year, because you would take a day off every, every, every week, the Americans would train half of that because it would just get injured. And the, it really forces you to think like the nonlinear component of training every day, even if it's not at hundred percent, the compounding effects of that far, far outstrip the going all out constantly, because that is not sustainable. And I think if you apply that for me has been hard to implement because you always feel like you're not like going all out in this like type A mentality of like, I constantly need to push myself, but having the, it I think has forced me to be more disciplined uh, and patient. And I ultimately, I see it in the results because my marathon time went from two, I was running sub three for a while. But I really took it down from 250 to 248 to 245. Now, people might say that doesn't sound like a lot, but as soon as you go sub three, every incremental minute is like start being nonlinear, yeah. right? Like going from four hours to three hours is far easier than going from three to 250 to 240 to 230 to now the fastest man in the world. Like, you know, what is it? 159. It's like sub mm -hmm. two hours. It's incredibly nonlinear relationship. And so... It's a fun journey for me. It's, you know, uh, you got to listen to your body. You have to think about so many things, uh, you know, signing up for a race right after I finish one, but it's really the training that is very, very hard to implement because some, when you're training in zone two, you don't feel like, you don't feel like you've exercised, right? You're like, oh, this is like, it's conversational pace. And you're like, God, I don't feel like I'm really putting in the work here. It feels like you're cheating, but, um, it requires the mental strength, discipline, patience to, to see it through and saying, all right, I'm not getting injured. That's the most important thing in investing. Most important thing, survive, never do anything. Gambling compromises that ability because you can do stuff that like in investing, never do anything that will put you out of the game. And when you gamble, you do stuff that can put you out of the game. Um, and so in, in, in running as well, like, so it's been incredibly humbling constantly is, um, there are like last, not this last race, but the one prior in New York, I didn't finish. After 10 kilometers, I pulled out of the race and mm -hmm. I hadn't had done good training. I just, it was very hot that day, but I just to train half assed. I trained terribly, not structured, going all out. I came in really fatigued to the race and I came with a very high expectation of, of running a PR and I had quit running for many years and i retook it like uh, gone without running three years and also the idea of restarting is hard because you always know your pr yeah. you always and it's always i i had way 
the last I'll conclude this probably by saying I've now is we're close to the new year, I guess, is I wrote uh, a blog post called The Summit. And for a while I have questioned the utility of goal setting. Um, and I'll put an analogy of climbing. Say that your goal is to climb Everest. <laughs> um, you as a climber, I think the best climbers like have the goal. I think you always need to set a goal to give you some sense of direction, but how attached you are to that goal, I think is the difference between a phenomenal, exceptional climber and a not so exceptional. Why? Because I think you always, you have values and principles, but I think those should be very clear. A goal should not. A goal I think should be more flexible based on things that you can't control. And so you might say in the process of climbing Everest, you may get there. You may summit and you may come down, you may be successful, but there's not enough attention in how you got there because you may have compromised your values and your principles as a climber. You may have taken way too much risk to get there. You may put other people's lives in jeopardy. And that is not a sustainable path as a climber. You at one point will be caught and you will probably die. It will put you out of the game. But if you always have center in what your values and your principles are, you will make probably sometimes the decision to quit and say no, which is the, one of the hardest things to do because your ego gets in the way. But I think I always have gotten center around, I am optimizing for the long haul to compound, to do this, what I love day in and day out, and I will never do anything that will put me out of the game. And so if that is going to compromise on a goal, I'm perfectly comfortable. I want to say perfectly, but I'm more and more comfortable today of discarding a goal if it compromises with my core values and principles. And so I have constantly applied that. And every time I do, I never regret it. And yeah, it's hard because validation is a big thing. You always, you can hang the metal. You can tell people easily, oh, you know, I've, made so and so much money. I've climbed so and so many mountains. I've done this and that. And it's, it's more tangible and goals, I think help us to like dress up our identity, which is an easy way to do, but I don't think it gives you confidence. I don't think it gives you self-worth because ultimately if you don't, validation is one of the things that is nice, but it's you're dependent on stuff. And I think you should ultimately know your self-worth and your identity based on your values and principles and goals while important to set direction, I don't think should ever be rigid ever. Cause you're always, by the way, there's always another summit. There's always another 10 million, hundred million billion that you can make. It never ends well. Mm. It sets a high expectation. And I don't think you, I think you should constantly be trying to minimize expectations. And I do think one thing that's important, I just want to point out, and this isn't just about you, Santi, but like all the investors that are on Twitter and and they might tweet about a specific product. And I know like me, when I first got to crypto, like I would look to see what Santi tweets about. And then it's like, oh, I should invest in that. Um, you're not putting all your money in one product or one project, right? You're diversified. You're in multiple ecosystems. It's just like you described, you, you want to make this where your key thing is survive, right? Absolutely. And there is... A ever decreasing probability that this space doesn't amount to what we all hope it will. But I think, I think I have more conviction in that time and time again, purely because of the human capital. Like I, as, as far, as long as I continue to see smart, driven, smarter than me, people come into the space to build, I will be here. But there have been times where I question that, you know, but yeah. Your journey, I think the, the journey of going through crypto is magical, whether you end up believing in Bitcoin, Solana, Ethereum, I don't care. But I think it just intellectually is fascinating because it forces you to question everything that you've been told and things that you may just have taken for granted. And I don't think you should ever take anything for granted. <laughs> to set a goal to take th things for granted is to assume that you know things. And the journey uh, investing for me is you are in this truth seeking path. And also as a builder and that's incredibly exciting but it's not like binary and it's not static it's constantly changing and so that's the most that's that's why i am love this game because it's fun and it's entertaining <laughs> and i always say um i do believe in crypto and its future but even if crypto didn't work out like the amount of like intellectual capital and the people here they're gonna find something else and i want to be around these type of people so that's that's what always has kept me in the game
it's hard to imagine that something good will not come out of all of this energy and attention that is being applied to try at a very exciting and novel but early piece of technology. So I hope this conversation has been entertaining for people and it, it hasn't. Please let me know uh, to improve. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it definitely has. It definitely has. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on, Santi. This is a lot of fun. It's fun to have kind of a throwback and putting us back together. I hope we get to do this again in the future. Um, everybody Absolutely. needs to go and you should follow Santi because Santi does. You tweet quite. A, you're kind of like, Mur honestly, you and Murder are different. But have you guys been in the same room <laughs> together? <laughs> no, I'm investing in this company as a hope to get closer to him because I find him highly. Uh, yeah. Entertaining and something that I want to I, I pay attention to. For sure. Yeah, y'all are y'all are different, but in many ways, I can see like reflections of each other. And you both put out like great content and insights along the way. It's just like you. he's you know working on a business day in day out. You're on the investor side day in day out. So like you two in a room, I think we'll have to get you on a stage at a Blockworks conference. I, I love people perfect. like Mert and you that help me challenge my worldview. And I think uh, yeah, those are the best people. So yeah, thank you for the questions. Really, really exciting. And best of luck at squads. If you guys are ever raising. I hope I get the call, <laughs> but uh, you're going to kill it. Yeah. Sweet. yeah. Thanks, really excited Santi. for your journey, man. Thank you for inviting me. Appreciate it, man. All right. We'll see you next time.